doggone. Whoever was doing this early part of the service went way long on this this morning. I, unbelievable. Ah. We're in Revelation. I hope to get through the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 3. This is where we find out the scroll and the lamb. Next week, we find out what's in the scroll. But for this week, we learn about the scroll and the seals. Then I saw in, his right, in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scrolls? But no one in heaven, on earth, or under the earth could open the scroll or even look at it, the ins- look, or even look inside it. In chapter 4, John was described how God showed him heaven. Next, God's going to show John the plan for the future. And John was going to see how all things would be made perfect through God. Well, John saw a scroll in God's hand. He realized it was important. Well, duh, God's holding it. It's important. Why? God himself held it. The message was long. Scrolls normally were written on one side. This was a double-sided scroll. This had a lot of stuff in it. Other peculiar thing about it was there were seven seals upon it. Most of the ancient documents, they would, the king would have a seal and then wax, they'd, they'd put one seal on it. This had seven seals. It was important, but there was a difficulty here. Unless the seals were broken, this scroll could not be read. So a mighty angel, he questioned who had the right to break these seals. This indicates a search in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. John waited anxiously to find out who could open this scroll. He was anointed by Christ to record all these happenings. So he was doing that. He's not trying to explain a lot. He's just recording what's going on. But then the word come back. It had to knock John to his knees. No one could be found with the right and authority to open this scroll. The mighty angel could not find any great person. There was no angel in heaven, uh, no great human being on the earth, no spirit under the earth. That scroll had to be opened because God's plans depended on it. So in Revelation 5, 4 and 5, John wrote, I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the line of the tribe of Judah and the root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. I'm like John. I'm wanting to know what's inside that scroll that has to have seven seals. It's an important document. God had intended it to remain closed until the proper time. This is John seeing into the future. This is John seeing into things that are to come. This is the book of Revelation. This isn't something that happened 2,000 years ago. This is something that is happening Could be today, but today or my belief in the near future. Christ has the right to open it. We're going to learn in these next three chapters the process that it takes to open this scroll. When John thought no one could open it, he wept bitterly. One of the 24 elders that were sitting around the throne came over and comforted them. They said, there's somebody that can open it. So God had acted by his son, Jesus Christ, to open this scroll that God had wrote and sealed. The ruler reminded John 
This was always God's plan. This isn't an abnormal thing. This is what God planned for Christ to be the one. He referred to the two promises that God had made to Israel. The first promise was that a truly great ruler would come from Judah's family. That promise is in Genesis 49. Then in Proverbs 30, we describes the lion. In, in Isaiah uh, 31, God even compares himself to a lion. So Christ would fight boldly for his people against all the forces of evil and overcome. By his death, he overcome. By his resurrection, he saved us. The second promise was that this new ruler would come from the family of the king of David, son of Jesse. It's Isaiah 11. David's family ruled for 400 years in Jerusalem. You know, that's a long time for one family to rule. But then they lost their power as all human beings lose power. But a new branch can grow from the root of a tree. I've cut down several trees, and I've had new roots shoot right up there, and a new tree grow right where that old tree was. Christ came from this family, this family of David. God's promise about the lion from Judah's family and the root of David refers to Christ. He overcome the evil forces. Therefore, he had the right, the only right, the sole authority to open this scroll. I found this to be interesting. I knew it, but I found it, it was kind of, kind of written in a way that made me take notice of it. The name Christ comes from Christos, a Greek word meaning anointed. It's the equivalent of the word Messiah in Hebrew. So to be Christ or Messiah is to be the anointed one of God. And that's a really good way to look at Jesus Christ. He's the anointed one of God. Revelation 5, 6 through 8. Then I saw a lamb looking as, it, if, as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding uh, golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. John gives several special descriptions of Christ, and this is the second one. The first one was in Revelation 1, where Christ was seen as a great judge. Now he's seen as a lamb. Christ is called the Lamb of God in John because he died for the sins of the people, 1 Peter. The number seven is often used to describe things in the book of Revelation. It's God's number. A horn is a frequent description for power and strength. So seven horns mean complete power. Complete power. That's what John's describing. Christ has complete power. Seven eyes mean that he's seen everything. He had complete knowledge of everything. There's nothing you can do, say, or think that God is not aware of that Christ does not know about. It's the Holy Spirit who gives power and knowledge, Isaiah 11. The seven spirits mean that Christ received the Holy Spirit completely without any limit. Christ is operating. The Holy Spirit is in Christ through Christ. Psalms 11, the Lord says um, to my Lord, set up my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool at your feet. Right side has often been a, a place, always a place of special honor. Jacob loved his youngest son very much, Genesis 44, so he named him Benjamin. This I did not know. Benjamin, which means the son of my right hand. So Christ went to receive the scroll from the right hand of God. At, light, at last, John saw Christ in his proper place in heaven. Same place Stephen had seen him in Acts, up there with God. This is a place where Christ alone deserves to be in Philippians. Christ has invited him to that place because he dealt, uh, Christ has invited him, God has invited him, Christ, to that place because his death um, took care of the evil deeds of the people, saved God's creation, Hebrews 10. He overcame the uh, devil's power by his death. Now at this point, John seen something else. 
The four special angels and the 24 rulers who had been previously praising God, now they begin to praise Christ. They sang a new song. Then John heard as many millions times millions of angels praised God. We're going to talk about that number in a little bit. In the end, uh, every living thing would join them to praise Christ. Every living thing would join them to praise Christ. John saw that the prayers of God's people really do reach God in heaven. Isn't that good to know that these golden containers have our prayers? They reach God. I don't know if you're like me, but there's sometimes I pray, and I kind of wonder if my prayer gets much past the roof that I'm standing under. I don't mean that as a terrible thing. I just mean that as my own lack of faith sometimes. Is God hearing? Because when I pray, I kind of expect thunder to happen and God to say, I hear you, Bob. I'm going to take care of it right now. Then I have to remember, I'm his servant. He's not my servant. When I have these doubts, I'm wanting him to be my servant. And that ain't ever going to happen. My prayers go past this roof, so do yours. They go to God. If you've trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, your prayers go from your heart, your lips, your spirit, to God. <laughs> These prayers were in the same bowls that the incense that the priest used at the temple. They're beautiful gifts that the 24 rulers placed in front of God. So they sang this new song. They played music on harps. They sang a song that was original, a very personal expression of praise. Revelation 5, 9 through 10. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take this scroll and to open it, its seals, because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe, language, people, and nation. I think sometimes we forget that we're part of every tribe nation, and people. You have made them to be a kingdom <clears throat> and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. More of that later. In various places, the Bible mentions a new song. You'll find in Psalms, Isaiah, Revelation 14. This new song is to praise Christ, who with the Father and the Holy Spirit is God. Songs seem to spread in a strange manner. You know, you ever, ever hear a little ditty that you just can't get out of your brain? And if you happen to say it, the person next to you will start saying it too. Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Come on, say it with me. Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. We know that. It's a, it's a long word. But we know it. We memorize it. Now, that's how music works. We are a musical people. Even non-musical people are musical people. There's music inside us. We're made to be musical. We're made to appreciate the beauty of music, and it spreads. It spreads expressions of joy. At first, maybe to just a few people, but once others hear it, their joy turned, their, their thoughts turned to joy. They joined a song. They develop it. They sing it. Many of the old oral traditions that were passed down were passed down by song. That's how people pass things down because we can remember rhythmic. We can remember rhymes. We can remember things that tie together. That's why poetry is so beautiful. We are a very blessed people. Most of the time, we ignore that. <coughs> In verses 9 and 10, we, hear the, we see the words, a new song to praise Christ. Originally, it just started with the four special angels and the 24 ru rulers. Verse 11, And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round the throne and the beast and the elders, and the number of them. Now, we've got a math teacher in the class. We're going to give her a test. This is, no, you're never off. No spring break. 
The number of them was 10,000 times 10,000. Anybody know what that is? Okay, this is the final Jeopardy test. 10,000 times just 10,000. 100 million. And then you have thousands times thousands of these 100 millions. Now, it doesn't give us how many thousands. It says thousands, plural. Times thousands of hundreds of millions. You know, if you keep at this, pretty soon we're going to have a really big number. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings. And every creature, get this, every creature which is in heaven, on the earth and under the earth, as such as are in the sea and all that are in them, heard I say, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that setteth on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. So here we've got everything, every creature in the heaven, on the earth, under the earth, in the sea. All of them. All of them. He heard blessing and honor and glory and power unto him that set us on the throne, God, and unto the Lamb forever and ever, Jesus Christ. So we've got this vast army of angels that were praising Christ. Now, we just talked a little bit. There's many hundreds of millions of them. John's word that he uses is midrid, 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 M-Y-R-A-I-A-D, midrid. And that means 10,000. So a midrid of midrids means 100 million. A billion is 10 times 100 million. Now, that's 10 times. That's what a billion is. 10 times. So what are thousands times thousands of this number? I think I had it on one of the slides. It's a number that starts off with a 1, and it has a whole string of zeros that go on a long ways. I don't have a clue what that number is. It's a biggie. How many angels God has? We hear about a couple, two or three, Gabriel, Michael. We hear about a few. But all of God's angels, every last angel in heaven, is strong and powerful. This great army is uncountable. Now, you may wonder why God needs that many to take care of just this little earth. Well, let me help you on that a little bit. Walk out on a clear night, hopefully the moon's not out, and look out in the universe and see as much as you can possibly see. You're seeing possibly 7,000 stars if your eyes are pretty good. There are billions and billions of galaxies that have billions of stars, that have billions of planets. Now, why would God make all that and just make a couple, three or four angels to take care of Earth. God created a universe we can't even imagine. It tells us that in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2, 9. It says, your mind cannot conceive of what I've made. My mind can conceive of a lot. But God says, my mind cannot conceive. What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind can, can, has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. I'm not sure what my job is in heaven. I've heard people tell me, I just, if I just be a street sweeper, I'll be fine. I'm a little more greedy. I want every reward God wants to give me. I want every duty he wants to assign to me. I want to do everything that he has ordained for me to do. Now, you don't have to believe that there's other worlds, other galaxies. You don't have to believe it at all. You're perfectly fine because you're not saved by that knowledge. You're saved by what? Jesus Christ. 
birth, life, death, and resurrection. If you believe in your heart and do what with your mouth? You shall be? It doesn't talk about galaxies in there. I'm just looking at it with wonder, waiting. I don't fear death. I really don't. I'm like Billy. I kind of fear the process maybe, but I don't fear death. I want to cross over, and I want to have a smile on my face, a shout in my lungs, saying, God, I'm here. Put me to work. What do you got? I'm ready. My body will be good. My spirit will be good. I'll be happy. If I died on this pulpit today, some of you might cry. I'd prefer you say, praise God. Bob's having a glorious time. Jackie's going to say, is this insurance paid? Here's a downer. When, you, when we get to Revelation 12, 9, we're going to get there in a few weeks. We'll get to Revelation 12, 9. We're going to see that Satan brought one-third of the angels from heaven as demons. Now, if there are uncountable amounts of angels, what's one-third of them? You wonder why the world is so messed up? You wonder why there's so many evil people? Here's the kicker. Most of the really bad ones are still in chains, we're going to find out. They're still locked into the abyss. We ain't got the real bad ones yet. We got the nice ones. You know, causing murder, mayhem, disease, pestilence. The bad ones are coming. All these angels in heaven are praising God. It began in heaven, but it ends with the whole world. Everything that God has created will, in the end, give honor to Christ. Everything that God has created will give honor to Christ. But that does not mean that the devil, inhabitants of hell, the demons, will choose to serve Christ. You can be forgiven. And a sin you can do that you cannot be forgiven for. The demons cannot be. They made their choice. There is no salvation for the demons. They're forever locked in hell with Satan, or they will be. They know that. The ones in heaven are amazed that we are able to be saved. What it means is that they're not going to serve Christ means that they will give all honor to Christ. They can't keep any for themselves. Paul declared that in Philippians 2, 10 and 11. And he tells exactly what John is seeing in verse 13. Next week we're going to get into Revelation 6. Look at that, right on the money. Am I good or what? Now, oh, I'm sorry. You just added 10 minutes. Shall we go for 15? You know, my kids used to do that. That one there did that a lot. You're grounded for a week. Make it two. You're grounded for two weeks. Make it three. I got it for one whole summer one time. It was great. She could go to church or go to her room. Now that I've shared all that. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this congregation. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your book of Revelation to tell us what is coming. But Father, what your plans are. I thank you for my salvation and the salvation of those that are here. I pray that anyone who hears my voice and is not saved, seeks you, Father, repents. I pray that every voice reach out, praise Christ as a will, under the earth, in the earth, under the sea, in the heavens. Every voice will praise Christ. Father, I start today by praising your Son, Jesus Christ, thanking you, thanking him for my salvation. I pray for America, Father. 
I pray that we turn back to one nation under God, that we get rid of our petty differences, that we start following your law. I thank you, Father, for the legislators and the governor in Georgia who put a real restriction on this horrible murder of babies. But I ask that it go further, Father. I ask that our hearts be so turned against it that we stop abortions altogether. Father, I pray that you just touch the evil. Keep it at bay from us, Father. Oh, I've written, I've read what you have written. I know what's coming. I know men's hearts will turn, turn cold. I know that we're in for some pretty rough ride here on this earth. But I pray, Father, that your people be protected. Your people be shielded. I pray, Father, that we go out and that we spread the word of God, your word about Jesus Christ, that we become, that we become the evangelists that you would have us be, that we become the called that you would have us be. Father, I pray that we just start by loving one another. I pray for this church. I pray for St. John's. I pray you heal the division that has arose. I pray that you touch each heart, that you bring us together in love, that we can look at each other, forgive one another, love one another. But Father, to do all that is to serve you, to bring glory to your name. Father, I ask that you take our pride and put it to one side. Instead, replace it with the love that you've instilled in us. Father, I pray that with my whole heart and soul and mind in the name of Jesus Christ. And the congregation said,